Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration and collaboration creates community and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck and this is Face to Face. Well, welcome to Face to Face uh, on this very cold Friday afternoon here in Toronto. It's about minus about minus 20 degrees overnight. Uh, we're talking uh, to uh, Daniel Mullen. He's a, uh, a recent, well, relatively uh, recent PhD in philosophy from the Free University in Amsterdam. He's been teaching philosophy for several years now. And w- what we're going to be talking to Daniel about today is, is about uh, philosophical counseling. Um, th- thanks for joining us, Dan. Well, thanks very much for having me, David. And and is uh, is Dan okay? Oh, by all means, yes. Yeah. Do, do do you respond to Danny Boy by any chance? Um, very few people call me that. I think my mom still calls me that. And uh, but sure, yeah, yeah. Why not? Okay. Well, we'll 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 see how the interview goes, Dan. Uh, sure. So so uh, uh, and I quote: "Shall I tell you what philosophy holds out to humanity? Counsel." You are called to help the unhappy, close quote. That was Seneca, a, 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 a philosopher who lived a few years ago. Dan, why are you? Why do you feel like you're called to, to help the unhappy? Well, I've always considered um, philosophy to be a very practical discipline, and um, academic philosophy has kind of drifted from that um, since Seneca's time. And, uh, I mean, a lot of very interesting work has been done on sort of abstract theoretical problems, but um, I think philosophy is really at its best when it's tackling uh, people's practical and existential concerns. So um, I think philosophical counseling is kind of part of a growing movement to uh, sort of uh, bring philosophy back to uh, that sort of ancient uh, sensibility where, you know, philosophy is about how to live a good life, how to live a fulfilling life, how to live a meaningful life. And um, so there are several tools and resources that uh, we can draw on uh, from the philosophical tradition. So Dan, Dan, were were the, you know, you mentioned to to what philosophy used to be like, were were then, would you say that, you know, the early, uh, you know, pre-Socratic philosophers and you've, you know, uh, or, or Plato, Aristotle, I mean, were these the kinds of thinkers who were actually philosophical counselors in your mind? Um, you know, they wouldn't have gone by that title necessarily, but I guess, am I hearing that you're saying a good philosopher is a philosophical counselor? Well, I don't think, you know, exclusively. I mean, a good philosopher can can be, a, you know, an academic philosopher as well. But I, I think, yeah, in the ancient world, um, I would consider most of the ancient philosophers you mentioned, certainly Socrates and uh, Plato and Aristotle and Epicurus and the Stoics, etc. I mean, these um, thinkers were all very concerned with uh, how to live life, how to live, again, a meaningful life, uh, how, how to live the examined life, to use the, the Socratic phrase. And so uh, I think there was a real concern with, um, you know, using philosophy to talk about people's, you know, personal uh, problems and dilemmas and also societal uh, problems. And uh, that's really where I see philosophy as, as being able to do the most good. Um, I mean, the, the academic stuff is great, but I think if we sort of lose sight of um, sort of what philosophy meant at its inception, we're, we're um, you know, selling ourselves short. What what give me an example of a of an academic philosophical problem that 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 you know isn't necessarily meaningless but one that you would find um, you know not exactly applicable to to everyday concerns. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I suppose a lot of questions in say philosophy of mathematics or philosophy of science, while very interesting. Um, I think it's safe to say don't impact the lives of, of most people. You know, whether you're a, a 
a Platonist or a nominalist, for example, with respect to numbers, this probably isn't a burning question for most people, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, whereas, you know, whether we have free will, whether there's a God, whether, uh, you know, uh, there's a purpose to human life, these are much more relatable, I think. Um, and, and there's some value in thinking about them and thinking about how they apply to our lives and, and you know, how we, how we live out our beliefs in practical terms. Do you, think, do you think philosophy took a turn at some point when, you know, Hume said that, you know, all, meta, all metaphysical uh, claims should be committed to the, to, you know, all metaphysical questions should be committed to the flames. Like, just toss them out. They're not even worth thinking about. Do you think that philosophy tried at some point, maybe then, um, you know, to empirically start focusing on problems that it could actually solve? You know, instead of thinking through these things about purpose and about metaphysics that, you know, are ultimately, you know, questions about meaning. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, there's a lot, um, there's a lot to that. I mean, I think uh, during the modern period with this, and Hume would certainly be, be uh, an exemplar of this, when the scientific revolution was happening, I think philosophers were impressed with the power of the empirical sciences to explain things and really wanted philosophy to emulate that. They wanted philosophy to make progress and not to um, waste time, as it were, with problems that have been around for millennia and that we're not really making any progress on, and to shift our focus to, uh, you know, the sorts of, of methods and, and questions that the natural sciences deal with. And so then you, you do have a turn there, and I think you, you find this continuing through the 20th century. You find a lot of science envy and philosophy, um, with the linguistic turn and, and, and logical positivism and so on. Um, but I think, you know, it's really important to, to recover, in some sense, um, again, these more ancient questions. And, and uh, I suppose there are metaphysical components to them, but, but I think they're, they're very practical as well. You know, how you answer those questions, for yourself at least, even if they can't be answered conclusively, makes a big difference with respect to how you, you live your life. And so... I think they're important in that respect. So are you are you finding that, um, I know this is a relatively new shift for you, you've been teaching, and I want to ask you a little bit about that um, experience in some of your students, but are you finding that there is uh, a growing interest in this kind of counseling? I mean, typically, uh, if somebody had approached me and said, hey, you know, what do you think of first when you think of a counselor? Well, I think of a, a social worker, or I think of uh, somebody who's, you know, probably got a degree in psychology, or somebody who's written a self-help book. I wouldn't have said, you know, let, let's think about the pre-Socratics. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have said philosophy. And yet, as we talk about it, as I read about it, as I think about it, of course, it makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm just trying to track with the question a little bit. So how is how is uh, philosophy utilized in a, in a counseling yeah, capacity? Yeah, I mean, so the so the so the question really is 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 um, are are people leaning more towards this? Like I, you know, until till we had had our preliminary conversations about it, I would never have put the two together. I would never mm. never have said, "Hey, there are philosophical counselors out there that you can go and knock on their doors." Um, do you, uh, I would have said, hey, you know, there's counselors, go ahead. Mm -hmm. But at the mm -hmm. same time, if you and I got into a conversation about this, I would have said, yeah, any good, any good counseling really is based on the Socratic method. So, so on one hand, it seems like there's this sort of trivial truth that says, oh yeah, of course philosophy. But, but on another level that says, no, there's no real connection. So I guess I wonder, are people, are people tracking with it? Are people resonating with this idea? Uh, or is it something so new that it's going to, you know, is, are, are you still sort of feeling like there's a, there's a shift occurring? Or even an introduction occurring with respect to the work that you're doing or trying to do? Yeah, well, well it is a relatively young uh, phenomenon. I mean, again, you can, you can trace these sorts of concerns back to the ancient world, but in its modern manifestation, it probably goes back to about the 1980s. So it is a relatively recent thing, but um, there is an organization called the American uh, Philosophical Practitioners Association that tries to promote philosophical counseling as an option, uh, on, you know, on the counseling table. Um, as you said, there are social workers, psychotherapists of various kinds, uh, psychiatrists, um, but you know, some people have been to those professionals and they've, um, you know, they've had their uh, neurochemistry balanced and they've had their 
you know, emotions validated and so forth, but they still feel the need to, you know, find meaning and purpose in their lives, as, as cliched as that sounds. And, um, you know, uh, other professionals don't necessarily have expertise in that area, so it, it might be beneficial for those individuals to seek out a philosopher. And uh, so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make ourselves available to people who want to explore questions more deeply and um, and people who also, you know, think that, hey, I'm, I'm rational, I'm functional, I, 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 I don't think I need to be diagnosed, but I would nevertheless like some guidance with respect to a particular problem or decision or, you know, strategy for living life, and, um, and maybe they're, you know, disillusioned with um, some of the self-help literature and, and so on, and so they're looking for something a little bit deeper. And, what, and uh, again, Dan, Dan, yeah. what, what, what do you think? What do you think makes a good counselor? Well, um, of course, the ability to listen uh, is, is a big one, and I think ask ask the right questions too. I, I um, you mentioned the Socratic method a few moments ago, and that really is the basis of philosophical counseling technique is to ask questions that um, help the client come to, you know, a process of self-discovery. So it's this um, midwife idea that Socrates talks about. You help people give birth to, um, you know, to, to new insights and, uh, and also try to help them unearth perhaps hidden assumptions, hidden beliefs, um, judgments they're making about themselves and the world. That may not be serving them terribly well, and um, and just help them reevaluate those and, and see if they need to be revised or abandoned or you know or just reflected on in, in some more detail. So uh, I think uh, and I think most good counselors do that. And um, so in that respect, you know, philosophical counseling is is not unique. I think um, some sometimes philosophical counseling can look like. Um, other sorts of, of techniques like cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, it just depends on on um, you know the, the personality of the counselor, the needs of the client. Um, philosophical counseling, though, tries to more explicitly draw on uh, philosophical resources. Um, you know, psychology is indebted to them, but doesn't always you know draw on them explicitly. Doesn't always trace back to uh, the original sources. Well, whereas I, I don't know if you find this, but but a lot of the self-help literature that I've read over the years, uh, and there's been enough, I suppose, and maybe I'm tipping my hat here a little bit, and, but but I think a lot of it is is reflective of or mirrors a lot of Stoic philosophy. You know, and if mm. you read somebody like Epictetus or, or, or Seneca, I mean, it's 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 just it's it's repackaged it's been rehashed mm -hmm. in in and and that's not necessarily a bad thing i suppose cuz no. like i said before when people think self help they typically don't go to the pre socratic philosophers or the stoics um, right. they think anthony robbins or um i guess the secret is that what they think i don't know yeah i think that is probably true although i you know i, I also try to reclaim the self help label a little bit um because j just because there is bad material in that genre doesn't mean that it has to be that way necessarily. Good. You know, yeah, um, you mentioned you mentioned the Stoics too, and that's kind of interesting uh, because I I recently talked to a uh, psychotherapist named uh, Donald Robertson, and he specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy, and he's very conscious of kind of the Stoic origins of that. Uh, in fact, um, I believe it was Albert Ellis who was the founder of rational emotive behavioral therapy, which is a, is a forerunner to CBT, he quoted the uh, philosopher Epictetus who said that, you know, we are not troubled by events, but by our opinions of them. Right. You know, and that's how he, that's how he started his, his method. And, and so, yeah, I mean, a lot of these uh, uh, psychological techniques and also self-help uh, material is indebted very much to philosophy. And if you go back and read some ancient philosophers, it sounds kind of like self-help. I mean, if you had to pick a contemporary genre, it might be a little bit anachronistic, but if you had to, to, to pick a, a genre, I mean, it's not fiction, it's not biography, it's, you know, it, it seems like self-help. So, um, yeah, I think there's there's a lot that can be sort of gleaned from, from philosophy, particularly a lot of ancient philosophy, 
um, that can be, you know, useful to people today. I, I mean, I was reading an article recently in, in Forbes about uh, the popularity of Marcus Aurelius among CEOs, you know. Um, people are sort of rediscovering this material, yeah. and, I, and I think that's interesting. I think that's true. I was in a conversation recently over Christmas, and somebody was talking about how they had recently just listened to The Art of War and uh, how they... Uh, this particular writer or this particular, uh, you know, uh, person who, who, who had adapted this uh, piece mm. uh, was applying it, of course, to, you know, leadership lessons or life lessons of some kind mm. that was connected to, to uh, I guess, reaping the benefits in the business world. Um, well, I think there's, uh, I think there's something to that. And I mean, let's hope that there is a bit of a resurgence of some of this literature. Do you think that, um, I mean, there's not a direct connection between philosophy and self-help, that's for sure. And so, I mean, some of the most uh, difficult and anti-relational people, I would, I would say, have been some of the academics I've met over the years. Um, sure. You know, they're a tough lot, and they're very much about, uh, they've got this myopic worldview for the most part. They're focused on their, their PhD, their thesis, their, their research, etc. They're, they're, they're highly anti-relational in a way. Um, mm -hmm. can, can you explain that paradox at all? Or is it, is it, that, is it, is it, is it that they just haven't got enough philosophy? Is that what it is, Dan? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's no, there's no guarantee that studying philosophy certainly will make you a better person. I mean, that's, that I think is obvious, um, you know, from the, the anecdotes you mentioned and I, and I, you know, I've had, I've met, uh, you know, very antisocial people who are just happen to be philosophers as well, and, and it's tempting to say, well, is there a correlation there? Um, I think the problem is that, uh, you know, academic philosophy and, and the, the system by which philosophers are trained uh, seems to be a very kind of isolating process in terms of it, it, it can it can stifle one's relationships, it can it can um, isolate one from the, you know, quote-unquote real world of, of ordinary, again, in scare quotes, people. And uh, so, you know, and also a lot of people who are drawn to philosophy, and I would include myself in this, are, are perhaps, you know, shy introverts. And that process just exacerbates their personal hang-ups, sure. you know. Yeah. Sure. Um, but I don't think that's, again, necessarily the case. I think that... Um, you know, philosophy isn't a panacea for, for all of these sorts of problems. But I think in, in uh, you know, in, in, in context and, and in conversation with a lot of other um, sources, including, you know, um, psychology and, and also uh, uh, religion and, and various uh, spirituality, other, other sorts of, um, um, you know, techniques that have been applied in counseling practice, I think it can be very valuable. It can be it can be another modality in which people can experience personal growth. So you taught for for about five years, I believe, and uh, are, are you still teaching? I'm not at the moment, but I, I would like to get back into it. I, I actually um, I hope to teach a continuing studies course at some point in the future, um, either on philosophy for counselors or on um, critical thinking for business. I'm, I'm sort of working on those proposals now. Um, but yeah, I did teach for five years. Um, and what and I, I enjoyed, yeah, sorry? What, what I'm, what I'm interested in, in, in that, Dan, is what, what, um, how do you think that, that your teaching prepared you for this role? Uh, or what are some of the lessons that maybe you learned from your students? Or maybe what are, what are some of the, you know, conclusions you made, uh, about mm -hmm. experience from, from, uh, from those five years? Uh, well, the, I obviously met a lot of students who reminded me of, of myself, you know, at a younger stage. Um, uh, they were coming to a philosophy class, yes, to get a to get a good grade and, and to do the sorts of things you're supposed to do uh, at University Broaden Your Horizons and, and so forth. But um, I was able to talk with many of them after class and in my office hours who really seemed to appreciate um, philosophy as a way to sort things out, you know, they, they, they have these questions, um, they come to university, maybe they think they're a little bit odd for even asking these questions, but then they discover, you know, through a philosophy class that, hey, you know, other people have asked this, I'm not so alone in this, and, um, and maybe they've also asked, you know, questions of their parents and of their 
teachers in high school and of their clergy and, and haven't really gotten much by way of answer. Uh, and so philosophy is kind of a, of a breath of fresh air for, for, for those students. And so I had many uh, fruitful hours of conversation with students in my during my office hours about subjects that they were they were somewhat related to the to the course that I was teaching, but often um, the students would want to talk about other things and just ask a philosopher's opinion, believe it or not, on other things, things in their their, their lives or current events or what have you. And and so uh, we talk about those things, and and I didn't mind that it you know it, it wasn't about how they could raise their grade or you know what was going to be on the test. I actually it was refreshing when a student would just want to talk about you know, life or, or, you know, these existential sorts of concerns. And so I really kind of credit that uh, with helping me kind of realize that, hey, this is a, this, there could be a market for this. There may be people, you know, beyond just students taking a philosophy course, because after all, not everybody has, you know, the time or the luxury to take a university course. Maybe you know other people could take advantage of this, and but but where do they go to do that? You know what what's the outlet for them to ask these sorts of questions in a safe space where they're not going to be judged by their peers or you know people think they're odd or you know these are taboo subjects. Why are you bringing this up? You know so yeah, I think that experience really was kind of eye opening, and I thought, well, yeah, why why aren't there philosophical counselors? And then of course I discovered that that other people were 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 blazing the trail, but. Yeah, that was kind of the, the entree into it. Charles, Charles Sykes says that uh, in a book, I don't know if you've read it, it's called A Nation of Victims. And, and uh, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, it was published. And he, he talks about this, you know, this victimized culture that we live in here in the West. And perhaps even he would extend that to globally now. But we all... <clears throat> You know, we all we all need therapy of one kind or another, and 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 we're turning into this nation, uh, this medicated nation of, of of victims. Do you mm -hmm. think that might have something to do with this, uh, the lack of conversation, the fact that schools and universities aren't about these existential questions, that courses are more about Marx and more about you know the the structure and oh I've got to get a job et cetera et cetera so it becomes more about the ideological sort of inferences of what a university education is all about than actually learning how to think or um, as you said earlier on at the beginning of the conversation how to live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot to that. I mean, we we live in a world uh, that values kind of instrumental knowledge. You know, uh, what are you going to do with that degree? You know, a philosophy major that's that's not going to be useful, et cetera. And no, I think you're right. I think university education is more about um, a couple of different things. One is kind of the instrumental side of you know uh, educating students to prepare them for the job market, but also kind of uh, an ideological side as well, uh, you know, trying to promote a, a certain um, political agenda, and so it, it's less about um, it's less about kind of freedom of thought, uh, you know, and 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 the classics and uh, and becoming um, you know a a citizen of the world or you know a citizen of a democracy or a a good human being than it is about you know learning these um, skills that you hope will, will get you a job and, and learning how to, you know, not question the reigning political paradigm. And I, and I think both of those are problematic uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that um, we really need to, to, to recapture that. But if it's not going to happen in the mainstream university, it might have to happen um, outside of it. It might have to be, you know, people taking initiative and, and, and learning for themselves and, and again, I, I see philosophical counseling as as a resource for people who, you know, want to to learn more, and uh, and do so at their own pace, and 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 tailor um, these kind of discussions to their own concerns and so forth. Sometimes I wonder if part of the reason why, you know, I think I do agree with Sykes on this whole idea of a nation of victims that we're living in and, and how most of us are damaged goods on one level or another. You know, we're all carrying our own baggage and so on. And, and sometimes I think we just haven't spent enough time 
uh, with people uh, that are close, uh, that are friends, that are philosophers, whatever you want to call them, in, a, in an inclusive environment when we can, uh, you know, mm-hmm. feel, feel uh, liberated enough to ask those questions, you know, to ask those more difficult questions, you know, re- re- being raised in a, you know, in a very, let's say, scientific worldview or from a very religious worldview. I mean, they could both be as equally as close-minded. And, mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, there would be lots of things that you wouldn't, be allowed to sort of even approach. Certainly, in my mm. my upbringing, it was it was like that. And so, I wonder if when you talked about your students coming to your office and those office hours, I wonder if we all had a few more office hours, if we'd be better off. You're absolutely right. I mean, if we had more office hours, uh, you know, as, as faculty, and, and just made ourselves more available to students without being afraid of, you know. Uh, I guess the administration and the institution that, that tries to put, um, you know, very strict boundaries on, you know, what, uh, you know, what, what sort of subjects we ought to broach and so forth. I think, I think that's where real learning happens is, is in taking the risk and in, you know, opening yourself up and saying, yeah, I struggle with these issues too. And let's, let's have a conversation about it, you know? Um, absolutely. Who are, who are some of the people that you go to for, for these kinds of, Things or, 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 or used to go to. Uh, I mean, I think of the French and the German existentialists, to be sure, uh, more recently mm-hmm. in the last hundred years or so, but who are, who are some of your favorites? Where have you gained some of the most uh, tangible kind of world, uh, applicably, applicable in worldly wisdom? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, um, for myself, I, I go back a lot to the ancients. Um, the existentialist tradition is is great. Um, one of the books that really changed um, my life, I don't think that's an overstatement, was uh, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. And um, he took a very, an existentialist approach, but also a very therapeutic approach. Um, and, of course, he's, he's known for, for uh, his uh, counseling practice as well. Uh, so that was a, that was a valuable resource to me. I uh, I also um, talked a lot with uh, a mentor of mine, and and uh, he since passed away, Theo Plantinga, who you you also knew. Yes. Um, and uh, I mean, he was he was really ahead of the curve on this, I think, because he um, he uh, he thought about this a lot. You know, how can philosophers um, you know make themselves available to, to people? You know, basically philosophical counseling is what he was. Uh, you know, sketching out, and we spent a lot of time during his office hours talking about you know all manner of things, and uh, and um, and he he really you know he, he vocalized once to me you know why why can't uh, philosophers kind of offer um, their services you know on the same footing as psychologists for example or, or other types of counselors why why can't philosophy be a, a helping profession. You know, in addition to having priests and pastors and rabbis and psychotherapists and so on, why, why not philosophers? Why can't we join um, that guild? You know, and I think it's a very good question, and and I think there's really no reason why we, we we shouldn't make ourselves available in that way well, because. I think, um, Dan, yeah. I think I think Theo was was certainly, and I, and I did know him quite well, as you know, and and we too had many conversations, not so much around philosophical counseling, but. But uh, just around issues, tangibility issues, you know, mm-hmm. how, how do you make philosophy practical? And I love the fact that that's kind of how we started the, the conversation today. You and I was, was about this, you know, how do you make something that has been so often viewed as purely academic, very abstract, you know, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin and so on, mm-hmm. um, you know, these utterly absurd questions that really are, are, good part, are good stories to tell at a party, but don't really affect how you're going to raise your children. They're not going to affect how you drive to work in the morning or how you're going to love your wife or your, or, or whatever it is. And, and, and I, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, other than say, do more of the kind of thing that you're doing, you know, root, uh, root philosophy where the rubber meets the road. And, and I, I, I continually find myself in conversations trying to do a little bit of philosophy or saying, or remind or or mentioning to folks when they're in the middle of it saying, you know what, you're, we're, we're doing a bit of philosophy right now. You do, you, you know, mm-hmm. And, and, well, and almost trying to, I think you said, reclaim the self-help label. I think in some ways we've got to reclaim what philosophy is all about. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think people are natural philosophers, even if, as you say, they don't know it. Or It's good. You yeah, know, I, they're, think, they're, I think you're right. They, we all philosophize. We might not 
stick that label on it or we might not do it that consciously, you know, consciously think I'm doing philosophy now, but everybody, everybody's, you know, thinking about deep questions. I, I think, you know, people are just naturally drawn to that. And, um, so yeah, I think, I think it, 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 almost anybody could be, you know, uh, could, could gain some value from just living a more reflective life. You know, the, the examined life is not worth living is what Socrates says. I think that's a bit of an overstatement, but certainly, you know, I think the unexamined life is, is less fulfilling. Yeah. Um, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a, a joke right now. Uh, I think it's a Woody Allen reference about the examine. You know, he, he says something about the unexamined, you know, Socrates said the unexamined life's not worth living. Well, I'm here to tell you the examined life's not so hot either. It's <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Something. Well, you can, you can obsessively examine, I think. And, you know, there's that, uh, I think it comes from sports psychology, but there's this phrase, uh, paralysis by analysis. And I, I think sometimes philosophers are prone to that, unfortunately. But <laughs> yeah, so too much examination, maybe not so good. But uh, certainly, you know, everything in moderation, as I think Aristotle said. I think Aristotle said that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, tell me, tell me, what are some of the? Uh, we're getting pretty close, actually, to, to wrapping up uh, for today, sure. unfortunately. But tell me a, about a couple of the deeper questions, either for some of your your clients or for some of your students, or even even for yourself. Can you can you can you tell me what they are? Sure. Well, I think um, um, basically identity, like uh, what, how do I how do I identify myself? Like, what uh, what's my place in this world? What's the meaning of my life? Um, what's what's my relation to um, you know my family and my peers? Uh, these seem to come up quite a bit, um, you know, in my talks with students and also with the uh, the clients I've had thus far. Um, and also related to that, you know, issues of um, uh, social alienation. Um, you know, uh, people who feel isolated, and uh, again, I think it's 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 related to this existential question of you know meaning in life, purpose in life, um, value, um, a sense of belonging, uh, you know, uh, the need to feel loved and appreciated. All of these things, you know, not not to just you know the temptation you know of the existentialist is to fall into nihilism, you know, and 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 a lot of people kind of stand on that on that brink and and really you know want somebody to to throw them a lifeline and say you know we you can find meaning in various ways, you know. Sure. I think you know in modern society this is this is an old critique, but it, it is very alienating, you know. It uh, I think we're less connected now, despite communication technology and so forth. We're less connected in, a, in, a, in communities and so on. And, um, and you know, we, we've created, um, you know, this kind of social disease. And, and, and you mentioned, you know, uh, the levels of, of, you know, medication. And, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, depression is, is, is huge. Uh, I think in the United States, it's, it's the number one, you know, illness that afflicts people from I think 14 to 45 it's it's, it's, a, it's a broad spread and um, you know is there something fundamentally wrong with all of these people you know or is it something societal that's wrong you know I, I tend to lean toward the latter and I, and I right. think philosophy can, can can begin to ameliorate that I, I think, you know, and I think this is what I was trying to get to earlier was in some cases, you know, my, my comment about office hours and your, your reflection on it, but I think sometimes we just, you know, many of us just need a few more friends. Uh, yeah. as, as, as corny and as, as sort of trite as that might sound, I don't think a lot of us get the opportunity that we so, I believe, as humans desperately need, and that is to be honest and to be truthful and to be authentic with others and, and to be affirmed. And, and I think that if, uh, you know, philosophical counseling can do that for people, I think it's, uh, I think it's brilliant. Um, how, uh, how, how long has it been sort of recognized in in uh, you're you're in the Toronto area. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you one of a few? Are you the only one? I mean, is it that new? Or, or? <laughs> there have been a few in the area in the past. I think most of them have uh, retired now, or do it in a supplemental capacity to to to, to another career. Um, so as far as I know, I'm the only 
full-time philosophical counselor, if you will, in the Toronto area. There are some others in Canada. Um, there are some out west. Um, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's certainly a, a new movement. As I said, it's kind of only only been uh, rolling since the 1980s, 1980s and, and really only had any kind of institutional um, presence probably more recently than that in the 90s, you know, with the founding, I believe the PPA was founded then. So, yeah, it's 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 relatively new, and, uh, you know, so part of the challenge is just getting the word out and letting people know, hey, this is an option. And, um, but yeah, I, I think it, I think it will, it will begin to grow. Uh, it's already grown quite a bit in recent years. I think that trend will continue because of these issues we've been discussing. People are really engaged and they're really interested in them. And once they find out, you know, philosophy is where it's at, uh, you know, I, I think there's going to be, um, an explosion in, in, uh, philosophical counseling. Yeah, I, I, I hope you're right, and I, I think you are right, and and um, I, I hate to do it, but I think we should we should probably wrap wrap up here, Dan. But um, uh, Daniel Mullen is my guest today from Toronto. He's a philosophical counselor. Check uh, check out his website. Uh, that's DanielMullenPhD.com. D A N I E L M U L L I N PhD dot com. Uh, you'll learn how to uh, think deeply and live fully, as uh, the tagline on his homepage says. Uh, Dan, thanks a lot for joining us today. There's lots more we could chat about, but uh, certainly uh, a great introduction to philosophical counseling. I think also to some really great writers as well. And uh, hopefully, we've certainly piqued a few people's interest. And uh, appreciate you joining us today. Well, thanks so much for having me, David. I appreciate the opportunity. It was a pleasure talking to you.